Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Well, welcome you. Well, first, I want to thank you all for coming today and uh, welcome you to our, uh, our Think Center. Uh, I'm Wico Van Ginner. I'm the uh, uh, president of the Chamber of Commerce here in, uh, in Wilkesbury. I think we've got a really good session lined up for you. We're actually going to live stream this. We're recording it. We're actually adding it to our what we call our 101 series because we feel that these are, are very effective uh, for businesses in the area to look at uh, and peruse at their, at their own time. So um, what we're going to talk about today, and it's a real mouthful for me, is preparing for and effectuating the sale of a closely held business. Of course, to do that, uh, that uh, session for us is our own Paul Rushton, who's uh, with RJG. He's also a uh, member of our, our board uh, in, here in the chamber. And uh, Paul, I welcome you to the stage, and thank you very much for the, for the presentation. Hey. All right, guys. Uh, first of all, thanks for coming. Um, two admissions before we get started. Um, when we do these sales of these businesses, we often include uh, other members of our firm to help us. So I've invited several of them. Uh, the reason is really if a question comes up in their specialty, I won't have to say, I'll get back to you later. I can just call on them. It's sort of the equivalent of uh, calling a friend. Is that we're from uh, who wants to be a millionaire? But I, I don't feel, you know, I don't feel embarrassed about doing that. Uh, similarly, we've invited a lot of the people. What we'll talk about as part of this is assembling a team for the purpose of preparing for and effectuating your your, your business. And those people will include other great professionals in the area. And so we've invited a lot of people we work with on these deals all the time. Great bankers, great investment folks, great accountants. And the idea is if a question comes up in their field as well, we might call on them. So I didn't tell any of them that before I invited them because maybe they wouldn't have come. But uh, the hope would be that if anything comes up about the sale of business that falls within one of their areas of expertise, that we could just call on them as well. Um, as far as the PowerPoint presentation, you might be asking yourself, why does this look like a 1990s era uh, you know, presentation? There's no graphics or anything else. Let's just assume I did that on purpose for vintage purposes and not because I don't know how to do it. I think that'll read better. And you'll have to see, whenever you have a lawyer do one of these, you see the disclaimer at the very bottom about how this is for general information purposes only. It's not for legal advice. You know, it's an occupational hazard. We, have, we always end up doing it. So anyway, with that said, I'd like to walk through what we're going to do today. Um, closely held business, let's talk about what that means. So it generally means it's a small group of people. It's uh, a business that's owned and generally managed by a small group of people. They oftentimes have a common interest. It's oftentimes it can be family-owned businesses. Sometimes it's people in the same profession. But what we're talking about here is, is businesses that are owned and generally managed by a small group of people. Now, the reason that that matters and the reason that we want to talk about it as opposed to other things, is that creates a number of problems that we'll go through later or more, more difficulties for them because they have so little support. So that'll lead to why we want to talk about it. The other reason we talk about it a lot is most of the businesses in, the, in this area generally and also in the country are closely held businesses. There's way more small businesses in this country than there are really big ones. And just because they're small doesn't mean they don't have a lot of revenue. But as we'll get into, they have some specific challenges when they're trying to sell their business that we'll talk about. The other reason we want to talk about it today is we think in the coming years this is going to be a very, very big issue because for a variety of reasons, more and more businesses are going to be sold. One of the main ones is um, baby boomer generation. They're now approaching the age where they want to retire, or unfortunately for health reasons, they have to retire. So there's so many baby boomers that the number of them that, you know, just by virtue of numbers, own closely held businesses, that's going to lead to a lot of sales of businesses in the next several years. The other thing that we've seen, especially with some of the newer generations, is um, in the past, if your dad owned a business, uh, you worked in the business when you were growing up, and then you ended up taking over that business. The newer generation seem to have other interests. Uh, they want to save the world or do other things that might not involve that closely held business. What that creates for people, though, is uh, someone who thought their son was going to come along and take over that business then doesn't have a plan for having that business um, succeed to the next generation, so they have to sell. 
we found that more and more that's happening, and because of that, we think it's going to increase the number of sales. Another big factor that's, that's pushing a lot of people into sales is, you know, people aren't even thinking about selling their business, and all of a sudden they get a call from a private equity firm. A lot of these private equity firms are, are offering multiples of earnings that are blowing people's minds. And so someone who's sitting there and had no idea that they were thinking about selling, maybe way in the distance they were going to sell, all of a sudden they've got a number in front of them that looks awfully good, and sometimes it's too much to move on from. The reason that's, that's creeping into the closely held businesses is private equity firms used to look for bigger targets for many, many years, and they still do. But there's so much private equity money that what's happening is they can't find places to put that money. And generally how most private equity firms work is if you don't use the money, then it's got to be returned within a certain period of time. So now they're looking at closely held businesses more than they would have in the past. Because of that, more closely held businesses are getting calls from private equity firms, and a lot of them it's pushing them to sell. So that's one other factor that's leading to more sales. And then the last thing is there's been some regulation in a number of different industries. The one I use, use as an example a lot is the medical industry. Uh, they have to go to, uh, for instance, have all electronic records. That was a cost that they had to then absorb, which led them to have a different calculus as far as whether they wanted to continue on with their medical practices. And what happened is uh, many of them ended up selling to hospitals or in a few instances, private equity firms. And so that's one more factor. That's not the only industry. It's a good, good example of it. So what happened is all of these factors we think is going to lead to a big push in a lot of sales of business in the next several years. Um, some commentators are calling it like a silver tsunami because everyone who's aging is going to sell their businesses. What this presentation is really about, though, is trying to help these businesses get themselves ready to sell these businesses before it's right upon them, before they're literally got the private equity uh, offer in their hand and they're trying to decide whether to do it. So that's the whole purpose of what we're going to talk about. I wanted to say, if anybody has questions along the way, feel free to interject. We don't have to wait till the end, but I plan to wait, and, you know, offer some time at the end to go over the questions. So why is it so hard for a closely held business to sell? What, what difficulties do they face that, that a larger organization doesn't have? Well, we've heard a lot, of, a lot of businesses when we've sold them say is, you know, Paul, if I don't sell my business soon, I'm not going to have a business because I can't pay enough t attention to the business to keep running it correctly. Because as we go through, usually the period within which you sell your business has a number of steps which we'll go through. And during that whole period of time, there's a lot of actions and steps that you have to take in order to effectuate the sale of your business. At the same time that you're doing all that, though, you've got to keep running your business. And with closely held businesses uh, that are managed by a small number of individuals and oftentimes don't have in-house counsel or in-house accountants, there's only so many hours in a day. So what they find typically is as they're going through the process, it becomes incredibly hard for them to balance those two things. The other thing that oftentimes hurts people in closely held businesses, especially if they've grown it organically from the beginning, is they've never had any experience with how the sale or, or purchase of a business goes. So they don't know the steps. They don't know all they're going to need to do. And accordingly, they don't prepare for it the way that they should so they're ready if and when somebody comes down the road. So what this is about is identifying some steps that a closely held business could take in advance of the process so that when the private equity firm comes or some other competitor comes and wants to buy your business or you get a, one of the fine brokers that are around to sell your business, you're ready to do it before. Because like we said earlier, it's, you might get an offer that you weren't expecting and it's an offer that's too good to be true and you're not ready to sell. Or, Unfortunately, with some of these baby boomers getting older, you have a health problem which your doctor says you have to reduce your stress. You can't, you can't keep operating this business. And all of a sudden, your sale becomes a distress sale. By taking some of these steps in advance, we can really avoid some of those problems. So here's the steps that we recommend. And, and this is for any closely held business, kind of regardless of industry, regardless of everything else, these are some things you should do. 
we'll go through each of these, but these are the ones we're going to look. Assemble a capable team. Understand the sales process. Conduct an internal audit. Resolve potential concerns that are identified as part of that audit. Maintain flexibility. Closely analyze and negotiate the preliminary expressions of interest, and we'll talk about what that is. Develop and implement a strategy for obtaining a market deal, which again, we'll talk about what that is. And devote the necessary resources to successfully consummate the sale. Those are things we're going to talk about in this presentation, just to sort of give you a road map, and we'll jump right into the first one. So assemble a capable team. When you're going to sell a closely held business, you have to have the right people involved who understand the sales process and do this for a living so that they can give you the advice you're going to need. It's a, it's a full legal team, which would involve a corporate attorney. Um, most of, a lot of the deals will involve some real estate, so many of our deals, we have a, an internal team. Tom McNeely is here. He's the head of our, our real estate department. He's usually a part of the team, whether it be looking at a lease or whether there's an actual sale of real estate as part of the, part of the deal. He works hand in hand with our corporate department to make sure that we're addressing both the issues correctly. Uh, Jim Valentine and Kieran Casey are here from our labor department. Labor becomes a big issue. Uh, there can be, depending on the size of your business and everything else, there can be issues with Warren, there can be issues with COBRA, there can be issues with your employee benefit plans. All those things we lean on Jim and Kieran to make sure we're getting the right advice. We also have different levels of attorney working on the matter because as part of the due diligence process that we talk about, someone has to spend hours and hours and hours pouring through your various documentation you have as part of your business. Nick Marinelli and Christian Tellick are uh, newer attorneys in our department who do an excellent job on that. In fact, Nick got the biggest compliment recently when we were doing one of these things. The uh, person who was selling his business said to Nick, I, uh, I think you know my business better than I do at this point. So I said, well, that's, uh, that's about as good as you could do for due diligence. So that's the team we put together from a legal perspective. But you also need very good tax advisors. A bunch of tax issues are going to come up. Um, we, we can help with those, but we really need a tax advisor involved that's going to help you appreciate what, 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 what needs to happen with those issues. There's also reps and warranties about tax issues. All of those things require that your accountant ha is really well versed in these areas and can assist you with the tax advice you need. We have some great accountants here today, and there's some good ones that, that if you get them on your team, you're going to do much better in this process. It's going to be a lot seamlessly. So you've lined up your legal team. You've lined up your, um, your accountant. Sometimes it's hard to sell your business. You don't have private equity coming down the road. Um, there's not a perfect buyer. There's the, not a competitor that seems perfect. So you get a broker. We have a fine broker here that we work with all the time, um, Murphy McCormick. And we oftentimes work with other brokers to make sure that um, the person has seen the market and knows that they're getting a good deal. So once you've got that team together, your external team, then you need to find your internal team. So we'll talk about it. The due diligence process takes a lot of time and effort. And you need someone internally who can be both trusted and who can find all of the information that's going to be requested as we get into. So finding that person, especially in a closely held business, which we've said earlier, doesn't have a lot of people involved is something that should be thought about in advance. And so that's what we talk about when we're trying to assemble a capable team. Getting those people in line in advance as we go through figuring out what role they're going to play in the whole thing, that can get you better prepared to sell your business. The next thing that we really, as we talked about earlier, a lot of people don't understand the sales process. The sales process is a very difficult process. It takes months takes a lot of hours. It takes a lot of attention to detail. Most people that we talk to about selling their business don't appreciate what's about to, about to hit them. And so what we recommend to people is that they really go through and understand the multiple phases of the sales process before we embark on the whole thing so they know what's coming. Sale process usually includes, sometimes a few of these are combined, but generally includes the negotiation and execution of a confidentiality agreement. Preliminary due diligence, we'll explain what that is. Negotiation and execution of a preliminary expression of interest. We'll talk about what that is. That's usually in the form of either a letter of intent, a term sheet, 
or sometimes some variation of those. More detailed due diligence, which comes later. Negotiation execution of what we call a definitive agreement, depending on what form of transaction, what structure of transaction you have, it'll take a different name, which we'll talk about. And then the negotiation and execution of ancillary documents, we'll talk about what that is, and finally the closing. Let's talk about the confidentiality agreement quickly. It's a pretty basic part of the transaction, but an important part of the transaction. Before someone's going to buy your business, and you know sometimes people just kick the tires and they don't ultimately buy it. So what you want to do, and occasionally you're going to be selling to a competitor, you want to make sure up front that you have a confidentiality and agreement in place that says when we give you information about our business, number one, you're not going to disclose it to any, any other party other than your bankers and your accountants and your team that you've put together. Number two, you're going to not use it for any purpose other than evaluating this, this transaction. And number three, you're going to use the same safeguards to protect our information that you use to protect your own. The other thing that you're not going to tell anybody about under this agreement is that we're even having discussions about the transaction. If it gets out that a business is going to be sold or that they're considering selling the business, sometimes it greatly affects the business adversely. So this agreement is important to get in place right at the beginning, and it's important to have it protect the, the, the confidential information you're going to be given, especially with respect to your trade secrets. The one thing that comes up a lot that didn't used to come up, these used to survive forever. What we've been finding now is people want a sunset on these provisions. So they used to be, you know, if we get your confidential information, we'll never disclose it for the rest of time. Now most people are trying to have them sunset, and some of them are saying within a year we want them to go away. We're, when we're representing the seller, we try to fight for that to be as long as possible and preferably forever because a lot of that confidential information, especially if it's a trade secret, we don't see why in a year or two it should be any less protected. So that's one issue that comes up a lot, especially private equity firms and some of the bigger people that come along. They try to push you to say, listen, this expires right away. We like to fight back on that. The big thing is that the, the, the selling party should involve their legal team early so that they get these protections. Too often, they try to avoid costs at the beginning, and they end up signing a bad confidentiality agreement that doesn't help it. Or they give information away before they've had a confidentiality agreement signed. For all those reasons, it's really important to do that sooner rather than later. There's exceptions, there's different things. We try to put a little bit more information in these materials so you guys could see them, but we only have an hour so we'll get through. One point on uh, these materials, uh, they're gonna be available on our website if anybody wants them. We didn't print them all out because we only have one earth, you know, and so we're trying to save some paper and it'll just end up in everybody's pile at work. But it's gonna be on our website and if anybody wants this afterwards, just let me know, I'll email it to you. But there's exceptions, there's basically a, there's basically a whole litany of issues to get addressed in these. You have to have a lawyer who knows what's market, as we'll get into later, and what's not on these deals. There should be some exceptions in there, like if you're legally required by law to disclose the information. But what you normally ask for then is, well, let us know about it so we can go fight that subpoena or whatever else if it happens. So long short, I don't want to spend too much time on the confidentiality agreement, but I do want to say it's an important thing to have in place before you start sharing any information. The next phase of the transaction is what's called, we call it the preliminary due diligence review period. This is the period where you've got a confidentiality agreement. The other party's considering, the, part, the purchaser's considering whether they want to make an offer through a preliminary uh, expression of interest, and they want some information for that purpose. What's key about this period is, is that you give them a limited amount of information. They're not at a phase where they're at all bound. They haven't spent much time or money getting involved with the due diligence of your business. They're just at the preliminary stage where they want to see whether they want to make an, a non-binding offer that we'll talk about in a little bit that they can walk away from at any time. So what we normally urge sellers is do not give them every single piece of information in the world for this preliminary stage. Usually they look at your tax returns. They'll look at your financial statements. Maybe a little more, but that should be enough for them to formulate the preliminary expression of interest. And it doesn't have you disclosing so much information at the outset 
that someone can kick your tires, walk away, and then use that information uh, to your detriment. Okay, so that's the first stage of uh, what happens with these is that they ask you for a little information. The key for this is don't give them too much. Try to limit what they have. The next step is where you actually get to a preliminary expression of interest. Preliminary expression of interest, like we talked about earlier, is an LOI, term sheet, or some other variant of that, and, and we'll walk through what, what that includes. It's generally non-binding. There's a few provisions that are binding, but it basically, before everybody starts spending a lot of money, it lays out what the general parameters of the deal are expected to be. Now, the thing that we've found that a lot of people do um, that is, that is ill-advised as a seller is, they don't involve their lawyers at the initial stage where they're negotiating this. And you'd say, well, Paul, if it's non-binding for the most part, who cares? Well, there's two big mistakes that people make in that. Number one is by not negotiating it up front, they end up in a situation where every time they're trying to negotiate down the stretch, the buyer points to the fact that, well, we agreed upon this in the LOI stage at the preliminary expression of interest stage and you shouldn't be able to back out of it now. And you argue, well, it's non-binding and all that stuff, but it hurts you from a negotiation perspective. The other thing that we'll get into in a minute is limiting the no-shop in this document because that could hamstring you as far as finding another buyer or, fi or how long you have to deal with it. The, the non-binding provisions of this preliminary expression of interest are generally, what's the structure of this deal going to be? Is it going to be an asset deal? Or is it going to be, we'll, we'll talk about a sale of an interest in, in the entity as a stock deal generically. It may not be stock, it may be a membership interest in an LLC or a limited partnership interest in an LP. But in either event, we'll just call it generally stock. The way it works generally is buyers would prefer to do an asset deal in most instances. Unless there's a logistical reason like you would hold on to a contract um, without having to get a consent, if you did a stock deal, or you could hang on to licenses that you wouldn't have to otherwise get if you did a stock deal. In general, um, buyers want to do an asset deal because it's a little better for them from a tax perspective, and more importantly, from a successor liability perspective. If you buy, if it's a stock deal, all the warts of the business, all the liabilities of the business you're taking on. If it's an asset deal, even though there's successor liability problems, which we'll talk about a little bit later, for the most part, you say, listen, we've only assumed this set number of liabilities. Anything else is, was retained by the, by the seller, and they're not something we're going to buy. So generally speaking, uh, buyers want to do an asset deal. If most sellers would like to do a stock deal, Number one is they don't have to deal with the headache of dissolving the entity, but more importantly, there's some benefit from a tax perspective if you do a stock deal. The problem is you rarely end up doing a stock deal. It happens for logistical reasons, but usually the buyer's going to insist on doing an asset deal. If they do do a stock deal for logistical reasons, sometimes what they also say is, even though we're doing a stock deal because it helps us from a logistical perspective, we can keep this license, we can keep this contract, we want it to be taxed like an asset deal, which, as we said earlier, helps them. So what they want to do then is a Section 338H10 election, which is basically, even though we're doing a stock deal, it's going to be treated like an asset deal. Now, the one thing that if you're a selling party at that point that you might say is, that's fine, but I want you to gross up the purchase price to account for the difference in what I would have received if it was a stock deal versus what it's going to be for an asset deal. So that's just one of the issues if you're a seller that you're keyed into and you want to do, and especially if you have some leverage, you're not forced to sell, but you might want to sell, that's something you should try to do. That's why you need the legal team that knows about it and a good tax advisor that can talk you through and help you with the allocation associated with that. For an asset deal, one of the big issues that comes up um, a lot of times you'll get an, a preliminary expression of interest, and it will say, amongst the assets that we're going to buy from you, included in that is your AR. They want to buy your AR that's in existence. Sometimes they want to discount it. Sometimes they want a, a, an escrow to protect you against if it's not collectible. But they frequently sometimes don't want to take your accounts payable. So on one hand, all the money that you have coming in that would pay the bills in the ordinary course is going to be taken from you. 
and you don't have that money to pay for the payables, you still got to pay your payables. It's not that deals are never structured like that, and oftentimes they are, but you've got to make sure that, that we'll talk about it later. As the seller's considering, what am I actually going to get from this deal? They've got to factor in if they're paying off payables or if it's a stock deal, if they're paying off all indebtedness. You've got to really appreciate what it is, and if that's not okay, pointing that out at the preliminary expression of interest stage is important because once you get down the road and you're, de you're, you're negotiating all these other documents, you get your legal expenses, your accounting expenses, all those expenses get really high. So the point with a preliminary expression of interest, if you're able to resolve some of those things early or find out that they're unresolvable and that you're not willing to do the deal that way, you walk away before you've spent a lot of time and effort doing it. So that's, that's one of the big issues uh, from a non-binding perspective. Another big thing is, okay, um, with respect to consideration, preliminary expression of interest should say, what's the purchase price? Are there going to be any adjustments? Oftentimes, especially in stock deals, there'll be a working capital adjustment. It's saying if there's not a set amount of working capital in this business as of the closing, we want an adjustment. Now, buyers will normally say we want an adjustment down, and sellers should say, yeah, but if I'm over that limit, you should pay me more. You want to know all that in the, in the preliminary expression of interest so you can really evaluate exactly what you're going to be getting. If there's going to be any escrow for the, um, as part of the purchase price, sometimes as part of these deals, the buyer will want an escrow either for indemnification obligations or for the collection of receivables or even to make sure that that working capital adjustment gets paid. All of that, you want to know it up front because that tells you what you're going to get paid at the closing. Sometimes those escrows can be held as long as multiple years after the closing to, to be security for an indemnification obligation. That's part of what you should understand and know as you're going through a preliminary expression of interest so that it's not a surprise later. One big issue, and the bankers will know a lot about this one, is Number one, whether any portion of the purchase price is going to be paid over time. There'll be a payment at the closing, and sometimes a, a, a buyer will say, and I want you to take back paper, I want you to take back seller financing in order, number one, to make sure I have enough, make sure I have enough, I can get the loan I want to get. Sometimes banks require, like, listen, you're going to have to have your buyer take back, or your seller take back some paper. The biggest issue comes up a lot is, and, and the bankers rightfully, because they're putting a lot of money into this, say, and that note that that buyer's going to get, or that seller's going to get, it's got to be subordinated to our debt so that we get paid before they get paid. Now, we'll talk about a little bit exactly what the extent of that subordination should be. Sometimes it's so subordinated, it's as if that money may never get paid. And that's something that a, a, a seller really needs to appreciate, is if there's real risk on that seller financing, they've got to try to take steps with security or other steps to make sure they're going to be there. Preliminary expression of interest sometimes on a buyout too, which sometimes the difference between whether or not you can make a deal, a broker will come up with the idea that in addition to the purchase price that you're going to get, which might be lower than what you really want, We'll bridge that gap by allowing you to have what's called an earn-out payment. If the business after the closing performs to a certain level based on the metric we decide on, whether it be EBITDA or some other number, then we'll pay you more money in the future. Part of what we'll talk about in making sure that people understand the deal is there's oftentimes a lot of risk associated with an earn-out payment. And the reason for that is you're not operating your business anymore. And so you've handed over the keys to someone else Someone else might operate your business really poorly, never achieves those metrics, and you never get paid. So that's one problem with the earnout. The other problem with an earnout is it's sometimes very hard to police against changes in the business or some other, you know, rather than achieve a certain level of, of success in the business, you can take a lot of steps that would avoid it. And trying to make sure that you can police that and get that money is not easy. That's part of why when we talk to people about really understanding the deal, which we'll get into later, they've got to factor that into the calculus. The binding provisions of a, of a preliminary expression of interest, just real quickly, the one big one is whether or not there'll be a no shop. So what a buyer typically says to a seller is, listen, um, 
I'm going to be spending a lot of time and effort on this deal. For that reason, I want you to agree that you won't talk to any other buyers and you won't shop this deal to anybody else during the period that we set forth in this document. Now, that's fair, and generally people agree to it, but what you have to make sure is that it's not too long. You could be in a position where if it's six months or something like that, you know this deal is going nowhere, and yet you're still in a position where you can't shop it to anyone else. 60 days, maybe 90 days is a fair no-shop window. Anything more, unless there's a really good reason for it, should be resisted. And that's part of what you do at the preliminary expression of interest phase. After you get through the LOI, you've signed this document, which isn't binding, but it is in a position where it set out what we think the deal might be. Then there's a much more detailed due diligence review. It's a review of financial statement, contracts, basically everything under the sun about your business. What normally happens is a buyer sends out after the LOI's, LOI signed a long, you know, 10, 15 page list of here's all the stuff about your business that we want to see. And, you know, it involves all your insurance policies, all your financial statements, all your contracts, all your environmental studies. The list goes on and on and on. So part of what we'll talk about later is equipping the seller to be able to comply with those requests when they come down the road. The one big thing that comes in in due diligence and one thing a seller needs to be very mindful of depending on their business is the really sensitive question becomes before we consummate this deal, when can I talk to your employees and when can I talk to your customers? And again, as we said earlier, when it comes down to, when, when you get to the point where they're talking to your customers and they're talking to your employees, as much as you might tell people to keep it under their hat, you know, everybody knows now about this deal. And if it's going to hurt you for that to happen and theoretically for the person to walk away from the deal after that fact, you've got to limit when they talk to your customers and your employees. So what we normally recommend to sellers is if that's at all a sensitive issue, that that happen certainly not before when the definitive agreement signed and sometimes not at all before the closing with customers or at the very very end the last few days before we close and we'll talk about that in a little more detail now let's talk about what a definitive agreement um, will include anybody have any questions on any of that stuff as we go through we're good okay so definitive agreement this is your major agreement. If you're doing an asset purchase agreement, if you're doing an asset purchase, it's an asset purchase agreement. If you're doing a stock deal, it's either a stock purchase agreement or it can be a membership interest purchase agreement. That's sort of what it is. It's usually somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 to 75 pages. I've seen it be longer, so it, there's a lot in it. And it, here's just a quick talk about what's in it. So the assets or what's being purchased is talked about in there. The assets, if it's an asset deal, what you're excluding from the deal. And when you're excluding from the deal, you want to make sure that, that you've identified those things that you don't expect to be in the deal. So if the deal didn't include a pricing mechanism to make sure that AR was considered, if you think the business is worth more than, is worth, in and of itself without the AR is worth what the purchase price is and that AR shouldn't be included, you want to make clear that AR is excluded there. All those things should be addressed in the agreement. It sets forth all the consideration that's going to be paid. If there's any adjustment that's going to be happen because of working capital or another reason, that's all set forth in there and how we're going to resolve it. The, any earn out payments, how that's going to be calculated, what the metric is, all that stuff is in there. The allocation of the consideration among the assets for an asset deal, that's when you're talking to your tax advisors and you're saying, what would help me more? What's a better allocation for me from a tax perspective? I've seen in deals where that ends up being a major part of what's um, fought about at the end because if it goes one way, it helps the buyer. If it goes another way, it helps the seller. That can be a big issue. If seller financing is provided, you want to make sure that the, the terms of the repayment and the frequency of payment is set forth in detail on there. You want to see if you can get any collateral for it. As we talked about earlier, you want to know what the subordination terms are going to be, and as we'll talk about later, you want to ask some specific things. The deal will also, if it's in Pennsylvania and it's an asset deal, there's, we talked a little bit about successor liability earlier. One of the main problems in Pennsylvania that a lot of people don't realize is that
if you're buying 51% more of the assets owned by a business in Pennsylvania or any class of assets that's owned by a business in Pennsylvania, so when you're buying usually substantially all the assets as part of an asset deal, that buyer is subject to liability for any unpaid taxes or contributions to the Department of Labor and Industry that the selling entity had through the closing date. So that liability isn't capped by the amount of the purchase price. That liability isn't capped by many things. Now the good news is in most businesses you're probably going to be a pass-through tax entity that you're buying from. And so for that reason there's, let, you know, there's no income tax on the entity level. But sales tax and some of those other things, labor contributions, it can end up being a big number. So part of what needs to happen in this definitive agreement is how that's dealt with. How it's normally dealt with now when you're the seller, you're trying, you know, if they don't want to deal with it, you don't want to deal with it. But how it's normally done is they'll ask for there to be an accountant certification as to what they expect the tax is going to be, and then escrow two times the amount of that. And that's generally fair. You just don't want it to be too much. So that's one issue that's dealt with. Um, one big thing that comes in these agreements is you have a laundry list of reps and warranties that the selling party is saying, or that, that, that the selling party is required to say is true about the business and/or the assets and/or the entity that's selling the assets. Those reps and warranties directly have to do with your business. So the more you know your business. And you, can, and you can make sure that they're accurate and complete, you can avoid liability, which we'll talk about. If there's a seller financing, you'd want to have reps and warranties from the purchaser. It's almost as if you're loaning the money, so the same kind of things you'd have in a loan agreement. And then there's indemnification, which is the scariest part of selling your business, and it's the part that we work hardest on to try to avoid problems. What indemnification generally says is, if any of those reps and warranties we talked about, or any, if they're not true, then the, then the selling party is going to indemnify, defend, and hold harmless the buyer from any losses that are attributable to that inaccuracy. Okay? So you have a rep and warranty, and it says, we've paid all our taxes forever. Sales tax liability comes up after the fact, and the buyer gets sued for it. You're paying them for that amount of money. And there's a whole, the other thing that comes up a lot in, with indemnification clauses is in addition to reps and warranties or breach of the agreement itself, what a lot of buyers ask for is something we call your watch, our watch, right? So they'll say in an asset deal, for the whole time that we, um, you operated the business, if, if any problem arises from your operation of the business, you'll indemnify it for us. And if anything happens after the fact, we'll indemnify you for it. And on its face, it seems fair. But the problem is, very rarely does a predecessor get sued for the operation of business after the closing. And a successor of a business oftentimes gets sued the other way. So it sort of seems fair and on its face, but it covers way too many things. So when we're representing the seller, we fight the your watch, our watch indemnification, as we'll get into late, later. One of the big things that get negotiated on these agreements are the limits on those indemnification provisions. The indemnification provisions are things that are going to happen after the closing. You think you got all your money, and then you have to give some of it back. So what's usually negotiated is a cap. Your indemnification, subject to certain things, won't go over a certain amount, usually less than the whole purchase price. A basket, um, until so that you don't get nickeled and dimed all the way around until a buyer has a certain percentage, a certain amount of losses that would be indemnified, you don't have to pay them. The basket can either be tipping or it can be a deductible. Tipping means once you exceed that limit, it goes back to dollar one. Um, the deductible is you don't go back to dollar one, it's just whatever's over that limit. Survival period, people want to sleep at night, so what you end up doing is you want to make sure that at some point these reps and warranties go away they survive only for a period of time after closing, which we'll get into. So at some point, you know the money you've gotten, you're going to keep for the most part. You won't have an indemnification coming. You exclude certain losses, losses covered by insurance, losses that result in tax benefits, uh, punitive damage, consequential damages. You make clear this is the exclusive remedy, so whatever we say here is what's going to govern the whole thing, not some other cause of action. And then there's anti-sandbagging and pro-sandbagging. What that means is,
if I'm the buyer and I know that you've breached a rep and warranty, do I have to bring the claim before the closing so that you know about that claim before you decide to close? Or can I wait until after the fact, sandbag, and then bring it against you later? I just wanted to give you a flavor of all the things that get, get negotiated. And there's a range of negotiation, as we'll talk about, on all these issues. So if you're selling your business and you don't have the right advisors, you might agree to a range of indemnification or a cap or a basket or lose out on some of these things because you didn't know about them. But by having those, someone who does this all the time, there's a negotiated range on all these things. Depending on what your level of leverage is, you can, you can push for one end or the other end, but it should be within that range and it's good for people to know that. Um, the one other big thing that comes up is if you are going to have a subordinated note that's either unlikely to be paid or less likely to be paid, the one big thing you try to say is, okay, I realize this money is going to be out there and I may not get it, right? Risk of the business or anything else, I may not get it. But if you have an indemnifiable loss buyer, before I have to come out of my pocket and give you money, you should set off against the subordinated note that you're holding there that is money I'm entitled to, you just haven't paid me yet. And by that way, you make it more likely as a seller that at least you don't have to give any of the money you have back, that they're just going against this note that you have a risk of never receiving. So those are the sort of issues that we go through uh, in a definitive agreement. The other big ones is restrictive covenants. We'll talk about what those should look like uh, and, and some other boilerplate provisions that you see there. The next phase, and it sort of happens concurrently with the definitive agreement, in addition to the definitive agreement that deals with everything, there's a bunch of other agreements that need to be dealt with. Escrow agreements, if there's going to be an escrow for part of the deal, that needs to be negotiated closely. Employment agreements get to be a big one. Sometimes part of what the seller's banking on is that the, buying, the person that's buying the business is going to continue to employ them in the business, sometimes with a very a very lucrative salary, sometimes what they were getting in the business before they stopped, after the closing. That needs to be really closely negotiated so that they're entitled to that money if they think it's part of the purchase price, which most sellers do. Consulting agreements, sometimes rather than employment agreement, they, they engage the, the, one of the shareholders as a, as a consultant instead, same sort of issues. Leases, as I mentioned, Tom McNeely's involved with our deals. Sometimes real estate's not included as part of the deal. And so that lease ends up being a place where the seller thinks they're going to get a lot of value. They'll continue to own the property. They'll rent it to the business that they used to own now they no longer own. So when that's the case especially, you want to have a very protective lease so they don't break that and you lose some of that. Or just the leases that, you know, uh, it, it, when, a, when a buyer's it may be entering into new leases or whatever else with third parties, that all needs to be negotiated. The judgment note for the seller financing, which we'll talk about, collateral documents for the seller financing if we're getting any collateral, the subordination agreements with the banks, those things can be tough, so you got to get those early so you can try to at least get them a little fair. Lane, I'm not saying any, I'm not speaking out of turn, I'm just saying they're tough, you have good lawyers. Um, and then the closing documents, there's a bunch of things that need to be done at the closing. So part of what as we're describing this whole sale process to the sellers, it's just to see how much goes into this whole thing. It's really expensive. It's really uh, time consuming. They need to appreciate all that's going to go into this so their eyes, they go into it with their eyes wide open. Then you get to the closing. At the closing is where the parties exchange signature pages to all these documents. There's usually a closing statement that directs how the payments are going to be made, and they initiate the wire. That's the end, okay? And, but as you see, there's a lot that needed to be done along the way. So remember we talked about, that's just the sales process so everybody knows about it. I'm going to run through our recommendations. we got about 20 more minutes. So I'm going to run through these recommendations of what you can do before you get to that sales process so that you're in a position where you can better take on all that whole process that we talked about. Number one is we just talked about how you're going to have to go through this extensive due diligence in order to sell your business. The buyer's going to insist on seeing all these things. You're going to have to give reps and warranties, some of which are going to require that you disclose a whole lot of things. And so rather than dealing with all that and getting that all together under the pressure of time and everything else with your business while you're selling your business, what we recommend to people is get that together in advance. We can give you the same due diligence list that, that will be expected of you by a buyer. It doesn't change much buyer to buyer. 
and you get it in, you get it together in a in a format in advance. You know, you have it ready to go so that if and when, you know, someday somebody comes to you and says, listen, I'd like to buy your business, that day you've got everything ready to start sending out to them to their data room so that they can start analyzing it. To do it during the process when you haven't thought about it at all, it's really difficult and you make mistakes. To do it when you've planned in advance is just way better. That's the one benefit of it. The second benefit of it is this. When you go through... When you go through the process of doing the whole thing, you can find problems with your business that would be something that the buyer is going to say either fix or pay me for, indemnify me for. For instance, you haven't, you don't have the proper licenses to conduct business in some other jurisdiction or you haven't qualified in another jurisdiction. If that ever blew up in the buyer's face, that's an indemnifiable uh, matter, almost always. If you go through this internal audit process, what you can do after the fact, during the process of that, before you get to the sale process, is fix all that stuff. So you see you haven't registered, you go register. You see you don't have a license, go fix it. The other thing that happens is sometimes people don't keep a good corporate record. So they tell you that they own stock, but the stock book says something completely different. Going in and fixing all that in advance is easy to do as long as you take the time to do it, and then, you're, again, you're not doing it under the pressure of, of when it comes through. Another thing that comes up oftentimes as part of this internal audit is some of what you do as part of your everyday business, you may not be doing at a level that's going to suffice when the buyer comes in and when his broker comes in. One of the big ones we see all the time is people have financial statements that aren't prepared by an accountant. They're not compiled. They're not reviewed. They're certainly not audited. Half the time they're based on QuickBooks or something like that. That's not going to work for most buyers. They're just going to say, listen, you got to get some real financials. Or they'll do it for you with quality earnings or something like that, and then you're stuck trying to deal with what they've done at the last minute. The other problem with not having good financials is you may not know what your business really is worth because you don't have the right financials. Furthermore, when there's processes like working capital adjustments or some of these other adjustments, it's usually based on a closing balance sheet after the closing that's prepared in accordance with GAAP. So if you've not done it, you really need to be in a position where you won't even know what the outcome is while you're entering into the deal. So that's one thing that we find a lot is when we talk to people about their in internal audit, we find that they're not doing certain things like keeping up, having good financials, and we tell them in advance, get your house in order, get these financials going, so if anybody comes down the stretch, they'll, they'll, they'll think, you know, they'll look at you better, they'll understand what you're doing better, and it could help your purchase price. The other thing to know really well about that is you're going to ask for reps and warranties as part of your business about those financial statements. And usually they're going to say we expect them to be prepared in accordance with GAAP. And if you can't do that or if you have exceptions that you haven't prepared, you've got to know it so you could disclose it. So all of that comes out with, um, with an internal audit, and then you're able to resolve the potential concerns. So again, in advance, you're doing your internal audit, you're getting your ducks in a row, and then you have the ability to fix those problems. And then the other thing with both of those things is, it's an ongoing audit, right? So you set up protocols as part of the process of when you do it to say, okay, remember we assembled a capable team. We have an internal person who's going to do this. You keep her in the, in the mix of information so that over time, from when you do the internal audit to when you sell your business, if you get a new contract, that contract's added right to the database that you're going to use for that purpose. You get rid of a contract, that database is gone. All those things allow you to, to, to really keep your information about your business fresh, up-to-date, and ready to be given to a seller if you need to do it. So that's, that's what we recommend to people do in advance of the sale. You also want to maintain some flexibility. So as you go down the stretch, you'll want to do some things. You'll, things will have to happen as part of your business. But if you have an eye to selling your business, you can make sure that you don't hamstring yourself as you go through. Two great examples of that are this. Most people, they get a contract from a vendor or someone else. They don't share it with their attorney. They just sign the thing. 
because they say, listen, I need this service. I don't want to mess around with it. I don't want to spend much money. The problem is when you're doing that in the context of when you might be selling, a lot of times the buyer's going to want those assigned to them as part of the deal because they need it as part of your business. If you don't negotiate them, usually the, the provision, most contracts, if they aren't, unless they're silent on assignability, usually you say you can't assign it unless you tell us about it. Or for a stock sale, sale they say if a majority of the business is sold, you know, stock of the business is sold, then you can't assign, you know, the, then this contract goes away. All you have to do is thinking going forward is as you get those contracts without telling them you're thinking about selling, reserve the right to be able to assign them and eliminate change of control provisions so that they'll be more easily assigned later. There's been so many instances where we're going to a closing and we can't get the other party to assign a con to consent to an assignment of the contract. If you think ahead, you can avoid those things. The other big thing is, um, as we mentioned, a lot of these are family-owned businesses. So for estate planning purposes or something else, somebody will want to give some of the stock in their company to uh, maybe one of, their, one of their children or grandchildren or whatever else. They might set it up in a way where, you know, it's not a, it's not a substantial part of, what, of the business, certainly not a majority, but they will own stock. Or a lot of times people want to keep good employees, so they'll give an employee grant. They'll grant them some small amount of the stock in the company. The problem that comes up is if somebody wants to do a stock deal, all of a sudden, you know, your nephew who you gave 1% has to agree before you can sell the whole company because they want 100% of the stock. So there's things you could do as a owner of a business wants to do those things. You just put in together, uh, you know, what's called a drag along provision. It says, you know, my nephew, I, you know, I'm happy to give you this, but before I give you this 1% of stock, you got to sign this agreement. And if uh, in the future I want to sell the business, you've got to sell your interest too to that same purchaser. By thinking ahead and pointing those, and you know, the nephew says, well, why, why wouldn't I sign it? I, I, you know, I'm getting this stock, I didn't have it previously, of course I'll do it, and if you sell, you know, worst case scenario, usually they say, if they have a lawyer look at it for them, I want to be paid on the same terms you're paid, if, you know. So if 100% of the purchase price is a million bucks, I want my 1% of it. That's fair. And so that's usually what it ends up being. But if you think ahead as you're going through the sales process and before you do things, you talk to your lawyer or your accountant, you can make sure you don't put yourself in a position where an employee, a random employee or your nephew or someone can keep you from selling the business. The next thing we really recommend to people in advance is we talked about some things you could do before the, even the sales upon you. This next couple are things you can do as you get into the sale process and as you're in, in the midst of negotiating. One is to closely analyze and negotiate the preliminary expression of interest, the LOI and everything else we were talking about. When you're looking at one of these, and they might look good on their face, you gotta talk to your tax advisor, your broker, and your attorney to say, okay, number one is, what am I, what am I, actually, what am I actually gonna get out of this thing, right? Like, what, after tax, what am I gonna get? What's the pitfalls here where some of what's written on this paper I'm not going to get? Understand all of that before you get in the midst of a transaction, if you're already signed the preliminary expression of interest and you're already spending money to deal with the whole thing. Know in advance what you're going to do. The next thing is understand what part of that and see if there's anything you can do to fix it. What part really looks illusory? Sometimes those earnout payments are not real they're not likely to be achieved. You need to know that. Sometimes the seller financing is so bad that you're probably not going to get paid it because of all the things you're subordinated to. You got to know that when you get into the whole thing. If it's not clear on something you're worried about, you put it into that because as we mentioned earlier, if the preliminary expression of interest isn't drafted favorably for you, you're going to be at a disadvantage as you're trying to negotiate with the buyer down the stretch. The other thing we try to avoid in that original preliminary expression of interest, even though it's non-binding, is for that same reason. We don't want it to say things like customary reps and warranties and things like that. We want to say mutually agreed upon. I don't want to have an argument with the other side's counsel throughout the whole deal about whether something's customary. I want to argue and say, listen, we said at the beginning we were going to mutually agree on this. We'll talk a little bit about what's customary, but I didn't agree to customary yet, 
That's the kind of stuff you do at the preliminary stage to make sure you've allowed yourself to be able to negotiate the thing. Another big part of this is we talk about a market deal a lot. When you're selling your business, you want to make sure you get a market deal. What a market deal means is there's certain terms that a buyer would expect to receive, or a seller would expect to receive from a buyer, and a buyer would expect to receive from a seller in connection with the sale of the business. All those different issues we talked about that have a range of negotiation with them, you want to make sure as much as possible that you get your seller in that negotiated range, and based on their leverage, that it's at the right part of that negotiated range. It can be difficult to figure out what that means in a, in a smaller market, but here's what we generally think is the things you want to try for if you're going to be um, trying to get a market deal as a seller. Number one is you want as much of the purchase price paid at the closing as you can. There's risk associated with seller financing even if there's no um, subordination. There's risk associated with earnouts even if it's drafted favorably in your, because you're not running the business anymore. So you want as much of that money at the closing as you can. If you have any seller financing, you want it paid quickly because you don't know how long this business is going to operate and operate well. Preferably one, two, three years, something, no more than five is really what we look for. You want those principal payments to start right away. Sometimes people say, you know, the buyer reserves the right to pay uh, interest only for 24 months because they want to help themselves with some cash flow. Problem is that pushes you down the road how long they have to be successful before you're getting money, and so we try to push it further. If you're in Pennsylvania, you want a judgment note. What a judgment note means is, and all you bankers know it well because you know you got to have it, confession of judgment, if it's in the note, allows someone, they don't have to go through a whole trial. If somebody doesn't pay them to get a judgment, they can just go to court and get the judgment, and then the, the party that defaulted on the payment has to try to open and strike it. It's a very important remedy for someone. If you're only getting a promissory note, it's going to be a lot of trouble in Pennsylvania to go get a judgment when somebody doesn't pay you. You need the leverage of having that judgment. If you're doing a seller financing, you want some security. It may be subordinated to the bank. It may be not perfect, but at least you have something. If you're going to be subordinated, you want to, number one, know exactly what you're going to be subordinated to. Sometimes we get agreements where they say, we want the, we want the seller note to be subordinated to everything. Anybody we owe anybody that you're behind them. Well, that's terrible. What you really want to try to limit it to is if a bank's funding the acquisition for your closing payment, it's fair that you're behind that. If the guy says, for my business, I think I probably need a line of credit, too, to operate this thing, that might be fair. The problem comes in is like, well, what if I do another acquisition? You know, should I, should I be subordinated to that? Our argument is always no. If anything, that should be subordinated to us or at the very least, Perry Passu, all, you get into all that stuff. But it's something that the seller really needs to try to get to be, to be able to get it done. The selling party should insist upon the indemnification provisions being the exclusive remedy. Whatever we write in this paper, that's all we're dealing with. You're going to want some limitations on the indemnification obligations. We talked about them. A cap, the larger the purchase price, the smaller the percentage of the purchase price should be subject to liability. It depends on the deal, but you know, in a perfect world, you're trying to take some of the money off the table that they're never going to be able to get. A basket is usually 1% to 3% of the purchase price. It's more frequently smaller if there's a deductible or higher if there's a tipping basket like we talked about. You try to exclude punitive and consequential damages. You don't always get that. You try to exclude losses covered by insurance. If the buyer knows what they're doing, they're going to say, yeah, but you know, not, not counting my costs, so if I had a... If I had to spend money to get those insurance proceeds, that should be indemnifiable. Um, if there's a tax benefit created by a loss, sometimes you want to try to make it so that that's not something you'll have to indemnify them for. So in other words, if they had a loss and they got, were able to avoid some taxes over it, you don't have to pay them for that loss and they also get the avoidance of the tax. They only get one or the other. That's a way to limit what you get. Um, the survival period for reps and warranties should be 12 to 36 months preferably no more than 18 months. Sometimes the buyer will say, well, I want to get through one audit cycle, which I think is fair. We see it most frequently end up being 18 months. You want to, one big thing for sellers is um, when you're operating your business, you have limited liability, unless you've agreed otherwise. 
with a bank or anything else. So if you're selling your business, you want to avoid any personal liability for the indemnification provisions. If that means you have to give up an escrow, it's, it's worth it. But you don't want to have them coming after you after the fact. Now, the buyers typically try to get you to do that because they think you're going to take all the money out of the business after you sold the assets. But in an asset deal, you want to avoid that. In a stock deal, you can't because you're the only party involved. But in an asset deal, you generally try to avoid having the shareholder, individual shareholders liable. Um, as we talked about earlier, it, you want to try to have indemnifiable losses offset, requirement for them to offset against your note. And that's for awarded or agreed upon. The other thing you want to avoid is just having the uh, buyer have the ability to offset against the note if nothing's been awarded or agreed upon. It's just too easy for them to go after the note then without having it adjudicated. Um, I'm almost out of time, so I think that got most of it. Um, like I said, anybody could see this, but I have a few more minutes if anybody has any questions. Hopefully, though, this is the last slide that I wanted to get to. The other thing that you need to do when you're selling your business is make sure that you allow your attorneys and your, the team you've assembled enough time to work on it, get them involved early, and that you, if you've got internal people who are going to help you with the due diligence and all these other steps we talked about, that you give them enough time to actually do it. We've seen that, you know, Maybe even you change their responsibilities so they could do it the whole time. So long and short, guys, I appreciate you guys being here. I hope that was helpful. Uh, we do a lot of this, so we've thought about this a lot, what someone might want to do in advance. If you guys have any questions, though, either now or afterwards, let me know. If not, I appreciate it.